Welcome to ECE 501B, which is Advanced Linear Systems Theory. We've already taken care of the first announcement, but I typically start class with announcements and goals so that you kind of know where we're going big picture for that particular day. If you want more information, you can always look at the website, which is on D2L, d2l.arizona.edu. And for me to start to understand you, I have your passport into the class that I would like you to create. And it's a little different each class <clears throat> with your name. And tell me how to pronounce it. I'll try my best to follow those phonetical descriptions. And your email and an up-to-date photograph in this particular class, I'm asking you about free time, and we're talking about theorems and proofs in this class. A lot of times we will assume the hypothesis. So assume the hypothesis here that you do have free time. So if you have free time for this assignment, let's assume this condition exists. That's what it means to assume the hypothesis is true. We're just assuming it's true. What do you like to do? Do you like to attend class? No, this is your free time now. So do you read, exercise, wash the dishes? What do you like to do? This is something that I can sort of, oh yes, he likes to vacuum during his free time. Something that I can sort of connect with you. The other question that I want you to do before you submit this on the assignments page in D2L and that's good enough to account as your signature is if you simply upload your response in either a Word document or a PDF but most things I would prefer ending up on D2L in a PDF form but you don't have to physically sign it uploading it is sufficient to acknowledge you've read your contract which really is the syllabus for the class but here is a link to a little insight into how to read mathematics. And once you've read that information, then write a short paragraph about what you took away from that reading exercise. That's what question or part four of your passport is requesting. Questions on the passport, and that's due I have to go back and cheat and remind myself that's due in a week, the 27th. And when I say it's due, that usually means it's uploaded by 11.59 p.m. The, day, the due date, on the due date. If I give you a due date, it's typically 11.59 on the day that it's due. Now what I want to do in terms of, oh, and I think I told you before class that I am recording these lectures audio and video, hopefully, and that will be posted on D2L, and you can now go back. There's no, unless I turn this around, this camera, and span it, now you're all on, no. I'm only capturing the screen up to this point. I'm not trying any other video capture, yes. There is some echo and there's a delay between what I'm saying and what you're hearing. I could end that. I could end that if you want. Do you prefer it this way? Okay. So I will do it this way without trying to give you speakers in the room to fill the space. Is this better? Is this more reassuring? It doesn't feel, okay. Just checking, I should have done that maybe before we started, but hopefully that's good. We've already discussed the passport. And now let's go into the syllabus for the class before we talk about the course overview and the first chapter of our first textbook. There's two textbooks in this class which is provided to you on the syllabus. And the nice thing is most of the material for this class is available through the UA website, or the library, the U of A library. And you can get to that through D2L. If you go to 
up in the top menu bar on D2L, you should see UA Tools, or maybe it even says UA Library. If you click on that, you'll get into the UA Library and you can start searching for Linear Algebra Done Right. There's a, a ebook for that. The second book is available as a PDF on the website itself, on the D2L under Course Resources. So those two main textbooks are available to you in soft copy form. You don't have to purchase anything unless you like a physical copy, and that's fine. A op an optional book is how to read and do proofs. This class is going to be playing with mathematical concepts and you're going to be required to perform some proofs of theorems. That is not available, but there's other optional texts that you can obtain as an ebook that also talk about this process of writing proofs. And I give you that information here. The attendance policy, accessibility, classroom behavior, academic integrity, hopefully all of that is not surprising to you that information and hopefully we can all abide by that. Maybe the more important part of this syllabus concerns the number of examinations. There's two exams and a final exam and the final exam is actually on a Tuesday. We will meet throughout the semester on Mondays and Wednesdays but the final is on a Tuesday. So make sure that you're okay with that if you're having a work schedule or if you need to make sure that you come during that second week of December at the right time. And that's a little later in the day. It's from 6 o'clock until 8 p.m. So make sure you get your rest before that exam. Our class is two hours before that. It's 4 to 5.15, I think. That's what I'm assuming. The two exams are scheduled in the latter parts of September and October, and you have a couple of days, Mondays, that we don't meet. One is Labor Day coming up rather quickly, and the other is Veterans Day. Here's the outline, and if you're wanting to know what you need to be reading before class, this gives you, we're really just walking linearly through the first textbook and then at the end we will get into the second textbook not a lot of the second textbook but we hope that the material that we're introducing for the finite dimensional case in the first textbook you can then fairly quickly or more easily transition into infinite dimensional situations and that's what is dealt with in the second textbook that's the organization of the class. Questions on the syllabus? So now let's talk about the course or try to provide an overview for the course and actually I think there's something to be benefited by you writing things down as we go through. Some of this may be early on, I will scroll through, but when we start actually talking about theorems, you might, I think, benefit by writing down the actual statement of the theorem and then the steps associated with its proof or some of these other concepts. But here, I'm going to try to, for time purposes, scroll through some of this. I've already sort of put it down on the OneNote page. But to get a picture of what we're doing in this class is we are really worrying about maps. And these maps can be thought of as associated with a system where the system has input signals and output signals and that structure can be associated with several different application areas. For example, in control, the system could be a controller, or the system could be 
a plant or some system dynamics. It could be the combination of those. That could be your system or that could be your map. Similarly with signal processing, you might be wanting to process information. You have input signals, maybe you're trying to clean them up, maybe you're trying to enhance them, you're trying to do something with these input signals to produce a desired output signal that may be accomplished by this map that's a filter. These are now application areas of these abstract ideas that we will be talking about in terms of maps. Likewise in communications. Here we actually sort of have this three stage picture of systems. The first stage is made up of three different subsets. The pre-processing stage where you now have a transducer, maybe it's a microphone, then you encode that information and then you modulate it so that you can communicate it somewhere or in some way. There's then a channel that you're pushing that information through. That could be viewed as a system. Then at the other end you want to sort of reverse the steps that were performed in the first step in the post-processing phase. Now you demodulate, you get it down into the baseband, you decode and then maybe you put it out on a transducer, now maybe it's a speaker. And that now all of those pieces could be viewed as systems individually or taken together. And that system is a map. It has input signals and output signals. Optics, another application area. Now maybe you're trying to process light or electromagnetic information and now this optical hardware is your system and what does that map look like. We may not get into what that looks like but we are abstracting that to another level and we in this class are worried about the abstracted version or the maps and those concepts in that from that perspective. One thing I will point out that I failed to do in the syllabus is the author of the first textbook has actually created his own videos and I've given you the link to those and so he gives you some information and insight into the pieces of his book. They're much shorter videos but there's 50 of them. We'll end up with about 50 of these but ours will be longer but you now have those that you might, before you read, you might say, oh, I'd kind of like to understand what the purpose of this section is or of this chapter. Or maybe you read it, part of it, and you go, oh, that didn't make a whole lot of sense. I wonder what is really trying to be gained from what I just read. And you can now go back and read the author's sort of introduction or motivation of that material. Hopefully the combination of that and our time together will be beneficial for you learning this material. Again, I'm sort of reading this. This is kind of like a PowerPoint version, but we'll slow down in a minute. And this is really just stating what I'd already said. We're going to generalize and put these applications into a more common mathematical framework, trying to create this way of connecting signals with a map. And here's sort of the picture that you can be thinking of relative to connecting this linear vector spaces. That's what we're going to be playing with, linear vector spaces. And you've done this in a math class, doing the machinery, but we're now going to try to think about applying it to more than just tall, thin numbers in a column or vectors. We want to be able to generalize it. In the finite dimensional case, we're talking about linear algebra. When we now put it into the infinite dimensional case where these vectors might be functions, 
we've all probably done Fourier series. Sines and cosines, those are, if you pick the right ones, are, are naturally orthogonal to one another. And we'll talk about orthogonality and inner products. And that concept you also will pick up on in the linear algebra, in the finite dimensional case. And there's a connection, or there's the common connection between those. Meaning, hopefully, the time that we spend with the linear algebra will make it easier to transition. We may not have all the time to work through all of the infinite dimensional material in the second textbook. I can state that pretty factually. We won't have that much time. But after digesting the finite dimensional and really understanding that, hopefully now the infinite dimensional information or material will become more easy for you to move into and work through. And this is just another way of saying that. We're going to try to learn in one of the domains, finite dimensional or infinite dimensional, and share that or use that knowledge in one to help us better understand or appreciate that same concept in the other domain. And here's sort of the the statement that I referred to before. We want to make sure that we are improving our mathematical maturity in this class. When somebody gives you or hands you a journal paper and your eyes just glaze back, well, after this class, hopefully, they won't glaze back quite as quickly or they, you won't fall asleep quite as quick, quickly. You'll go, oh, that looks familiar. Oh, I think I should know something about, oh, yeah, that, that may be I kind of, or you know how to investigate and work your way through it. Or now you're going through this long proof and you go, yeah, I understand the logic, even though they've left out several steps, I kind of know why they wanted to go from this point to that point. So we're not going to shy away from the proofs. And what I would also say is in the course resources on the D2L site, I've included some material that is maybe in the form of papers or book chapters, but it's trying to connect the theory that we will be learning in here with reality. And let me just sort of talk about some of those now. For example, the one of the papers is dealing with principal component analysis. Has anybody heard that before? I see a few head nods. So there's a paper dealing with Principal Component Analysis, or PCA. There's a lot of acronyms that will be floating around here. But the, the picture that is associated with that in two dimensions, we might have data that's coming to us in sort of pairs, an X1 and an X2 paired together. And that might be producing then some points in this two-dimensional space. Principal component analysis is really looking at what are some of the major sort of directions associated with that data. Or is it possible to sort of say that that data can be described in, if we just needed to collapse it into one dimension, we now have a line that maybe fits that data or describes that data or what's going on. 
or principal component analysis is really concerned with trying to find meaning in the data. You may just be given a bunch of data and you go, I can't, I, especially if it's more than just two dimensional. And you're going, well this, I've got 10 dimensional vectors. How do I see a pattern in that? Well, principal component analysis might allow that to happen. In two dimensions, you can kind of see what that means. But here, we want to now, with principal component analysis, find meaning, meaning from data. And some of the underlying mathematics that's associated with that, let me just sort of state so that when we start seeing those in the class, you'll go, oh, this has a connection with principal component analysis. One of those is symmetric matrices. Another one is eigenvalues. Another one is, obviously, you have eigenvalues. You probably have its buddy, eigenvectors. So now we need to understand these concepts so that now principal component analysis might make a little bit more sense. Or, has anyone heard of SVD? Singular value decomposition. And that's associated with PCA, or can be associated with principal component analysis. Singular value decomposition. Another fun paper deals with BCS. Anybody know what BCS stands for? Now you have to thumb back in your memory. All right, I'll give you one word. Bowl. What? What's he talking about? A bowl in electrical and computer engineering? All right, I'll give you a second word. championship. No football fans here? Okay, well, their series probably you would have said, oh yeah, I know what a series is, but the bowl championship series, which is no longer in existence, but it was one way that they used to try to compare teams at the Division I level of college competition. And that was in effect from 1998 to 2013. It was a way to try to rank football teams. Now they simply have a playoff system. But what does this do for us, or what's the idea behind this? This is, how, okay, maybe you are not football fans, but just as a guess, how many games are played by one team in a season, football season? Pardon? 19? They'd be worn out if they played 19 games. But co this is college. How many weeks are there in a semester? 15 or 16. And they, don't, they have some bye weeks in there. So, and they don't play all through December, do they? So typically they play 11 or 12 if they keep going more games than that. But how many Division I football teams are there? I don't know if you could hear that 
disgust in my voice or the laughter in the classroom if you're listening to this. But apparently we don't know quite how many Division I teams there are. I don't either, to be honest. But there's over 100. And if you, so about 120 or so. And you can Google it. I can, I'm sure you can find it out. But now the beauty of this, the fun of this, BCS, it, this ability to rank football teams is to try to rank teams that haven't played each other. If you have a team that plays 11 games and there's 120 teams, how do you compare this team, Team A, to Team B if they've never played each other? Well, maybe they've played similar teams or maybe they've played the same team. This is a strategy for ranking. So you could do this with okay, football on the global scale, a soccer if you wanted to, or baseball. Baseball pretty much plays everybody during a season, but football is a little more selective in terms of who they play. So it's interesting to see how this particular mathematical strategy or tool allows you to rank order 120 teams that haven't necessarily played each other one time. Maybe they've played similar or the same team, but not each other head-to-head. -head. What is used here is the concept of positive matrices. So when we start talking about positive matrices, you can go, oh, now we're in the football season. No, you don't have to view it necessarily like that, but you can think about how would I rank teams or something else that you now needed to compare that maybe didn't have a head-to-head -head competition. All right, so maybe you're not into football, but I'm sure you maybe know something about that word. You've probably seen or heard Google how do you figure out how Google actually ranks the pages? Which page floats to the top in terms of your Google search? Why did that page become the, the page that I should click on in terms of the highest demand? And here we're assuming no money is involved. This is the natural process. So here it's really what is the importance of a web page. In the course resources section of the class you'll find a paper that's entitled the 25 billion eigenvector. And if you can identify the eigenvector associated with these pages in the web, then you're looking for that biggest eigenvector, and now that's going to be the one that identifies the most important page in that particular search strategy. So obviously, a concept is going to be eigenvectors that's associated with that particular page. And there's going to be other matrix concepts that are important in that $25 billion eigenvector paper. Don't you wish you'd taken this class a few years before and you could have invented the or played with? That's essentially the IPO, I believe, when they went public with Google, it was valued at $25 billion. And so the fact that these students created a way to rank order web pages, it paid off. 
you may not get this much out of your final exam in this class, but maybe after the final exam. And if you do, you might just throw me a penny or two every once in a while. Just saying. So those are some fun ways of connecting the theory that we're learning. If you get completely sort of uh, burned out with the theory, you might go back into the course resources page and say, come on, give, throw me a bone. Let me try to understand where this actually has any kind of application. That's the purpose of those, and it might actually be helpful in your project. It might spur you in a direction that you want to investigate further as a project in this class. So now that is sort of the overview of the class. Now we're ready to begin in chapter one of the first textbook. And a lot of times I'll just say Axler instead of linear algebra done right. And you're probably wondering, yes, there's papers about linear algebra done wrong, etc. But we're going to be using this book, which is Linear Algebra Done Right. Some background as we start to work through this is we are going to concentrate on two fields. And this is actually, it's not the baseball field, it's not the football field, but it's a field that's a math concept. And it's defined or introduced on page 10. And this field, the two fields, are the real numbers and the complex numbers. Those are our two fields that we will be using that underlie all of this linear algebra that we're doing in the finite dimensional spaces. And this now gives us sets from which we get to select or draw numbers. And as I just said, we have the real numbers. That I may try to be consistent and write it as that double vertical R or this C which is our complex numbers. We'll be pulling numbers from those two fields. And if in this book, if it could be either R or C, we may just abbreviate that and say, oh, select Z as an element of F. Well, that means F could be either the real numbers or it could be C, the complex numbers, depending on the context. But if we want it to be general, we may just say, oh, just assume this is dealing with objects from F. And then you could say, oh, that's either real or C. I could be dealing with either one. In this case, C is what? It's richer than the set of real numbers. Richer in the sense that it's really just a combination where I is denoting the square root of minus 1 and the variables A and B are both coming from the real numbers. Is everyone familiar with these symbols that I'm going to be throwing around occasionally? 
In this case, the one that I've introduced is this sort of funny looking E, but that's now, depending if I can draw it, that's defined to mean is an element of. So A and B, those are elements of the real numbers. Those are our two fields. You could think about more abstract fields, but this gives us enough to play with here for real and complex. And in the book, they actually talk about several properties that these fields have to possess. And in particular, in or on page three of the textbook, this is described for complex numbers. But we'll just do it in general. One of the properties we want our fields to possess is commutivity. Meaning if we have two elements from our field, then we want, if we add those together, it shouldn't matter which order we add them. The operation, the addition operation commutes. Meaning A added to B is the same as B added to A and the multiplication commutes as well. And again, these are scalars. These are just numbers. So that A times B is the same as B times A. So we want in this field, in real and complex, that's okay. They do satisfy this commutativity. We also have an associate, associativity property and here if we have now three elements in our field, it really doesn't matter how we associate or group those three when we add them together. We could first add A and B and then C, or we could add A to the sum of B and C and it better give us the same answer. Question? So this the question was, is this all real numbers? This is actually, I'm using F, so this could hold for reals or complex. So F is saying, I'm not going to do this same thing for R's. In the book, they actually talk about it for the complex field. Here I'm just saying it actually holds, and he knows that, but he did it just to specialize it to the C's. Here I'm saying, let's just talk about it in general. So you could now say, oh, let me replace F with C. So now A, B, and C belong to the set of complex numbers. Then they better satisfy these conditions. And multiplication-wise, we can multiply A and B and then form the multiplication or take that product and multiply it by C, and that better be the same as if we multiplied A times the product of B and C. We also need, in order to have a field, this structure of a field so that we know how to sort of play, is we really need to have a 0 and a 1 in the field. And that allows us to have some identities. In particular, for additivity, we have the zero, which when added to an element gives us back the element, so that's the additive identity. And we also have the multiplicative identity, which is one, where we now have one times a giving us a. So these fields have to possess an element zero and one such that these conditions are true in order for our field to exist. And this is true for the fields of 
reals and complex numbers. So if you're trying to define another field, you would want them to satisfy these properties. We also want inverses. For example, the first one, for all, that's this upside down A. I'll try to initially sort of clue you in on some of this notation, but the upside down A is for all elements A in the field F, backward E, there exists a negative A such that if we add this additive inverse minus A to A we end up with the zero element. This minus A or what we're labeling as minus A is this additive inverse. So in our field we need to have for every element A we need to have an additive inverse in that field of numbers. Likewise we want a multiplicative inverse for every non-zero element A in the field there exists, and here's a shorthand for that, an A inverse, another element that belongs or is in the field such that if we multiply those two together the multiplicative inverse with the element itself we end up with the identity where this element is actually the multiplicative inverse. We have some more properties. Property 5 is the distributive property. And again, if we have three elements from our field, we'll just say element A, element B, and element C, then if we form the sum of B and C and then scale it or multiply it by the element A, that A actually distributes itself across the addition. These seem very trivial, but it's actually fairly powerful properties that these numbers have to possess in order for us to have a field to work with. So this now says that that's equal to A plus B I'm sorry, A times B plus A times C. Can you think of some fields? What did we just allude to that belonged to F? Or what were we assuming was absorbed or described by F. Real and complex. So those are two fields that we already know and so if you if somebody starts talking about a field you might just say oh the real numbers or complex numbers and be thinking about how those possess certain characteristics or properties. So we have our real numbers We have our complex numbers. And those form a field. What about, I just like drawing. Q with a line through it. Anybody seen that before? 
What does that represent? Pardon? So this is actually, if you've seen it typeset somewhere in a paper or in a book, that would be your, the rational numbers. Is that a field? So here are our rational numbers. Does everybody f understand what I mean by a rational number? A ratio of integers. These are all fields. Is everything a field? Like I said, I like to just draw. So here's a Z with a line through it. This represents the set of integers. The set of integers Z is or is not a field. And we have to have our two-year-old hat to put on occasionally and ask why. So is the set of integers that I'm defining or labeling as Z, is it a field or is it not a field? And based on your answer, I want you to say why. So now you might be working through your head and saying, oh, I need to go back and go through all of these different properties. Is, does it violate one of these properties? If it does, boom, it's no longer a field. Communitivity, associativity, identity, invert, oh, inverse, hmm. Is there a multiplicative inverse for integers? What's the inverse of 2? 1 over 2. Is 1 over 2 an integer? No. So the field of, or the set of integers, is not a field. Why? Because it doesn't have this multiplicative inverse that's required to be a field. And a lot of times it's very powerful to try to come up with a counterexample. And there is a counterexample to why the set of integers does not satisfy the properties of a field. So there are many times we will be able to prove results for both fields of the reals and complex. For both fields R and C simultaneously. without having to look at both cases separately. And I've already told you what we're going to do in that case. We're going to just write it as an F. So thus the book uses the notation or uses F for either R or C. And so if you see F, if you're struggling, you might just say, let me just look at it in one case to begin with, R, or with C, or let me look at it for R and then I'll move on to C and see if it makes sense. Let's now define some other terms that we will be using during the semester. One is this concept of a list. A list is just an ordered group 
of little n, where little n is actually assumed to be not fixed. Well, it is a fixed, but let me just say a fixed finite number. A list is an ordered group of n objects. And typically the objects that we will be dealing with are usually numbers. And if they are, we now might represent that list as x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3, all the way up to x sub n, where each of the elements in the list are coming from our field of numbers, either r or c. So x1, x2, x sub n all belong to f. If little n was actually 2, then we might refer to that as an ordered pair or a set of ordered pairs. Or that's what we are working with for our list, ordered pairs. If n is equal to 3, it's now an ordered triple. If it's n, we'll just say it's an n-tuple, where n could be 6, it could be 8, it could be 100. But it's now a list, an ordered list of numbers, 100 numbers from our underlying field, real or complex. Now it may be a little bit wieldy to try to keep writing that out if our vectors are 100 long. So a lot of times we'll just call that x or y. When possible, we will actually represent or we will use a single variable to represent an entire list. So that now we might just say x and that now really means we have this n-tuple x1 through x sub n. So we might just say, okay, here's x, here's y, and they're both n-tuples. And it's understood then that each of those have 20 elements. Question? Pardon? So how is this different from a vector? It's really not necessarily. So this could be a vector that we're referring to. So now a vector is just a list of numbers. Is it not? And it might be pulling those numbers from the reals or complex. But we will sometimes utilize things that aren't just a list of numbers. We might actually be talking about objects that are matrices or objects that are polynomials or objects that are functions. But this, if we do have a list, Right now we're just talking about list, a list, that's an ordered group of objects. So we could have a list of matrices. Then it's a little different than a vector, isn't it? X sub 1 might be a 4x4 four four matrix. X sub 2 is a 4x4 four four matrix. We have a list of those. So we could make that different if we wanted to. But if they're just coming from R and C, now we have a real vector. We have a complex vector. 
and the size of that vector is little n, where n is a fixed finite number. There's one thing that we need to keep track of, or sort of separate in our understanding or in the definition of this list, a list is not a set. Order and repetition actually matter in a list. In a set, no, it doesn't matter, the order or the repetition. For example, if we had a set, let's say that now we had the set of numbers 2, 4, 4. That set of numbers is the same as the set 2, 4. It's the same as the set 4, 2. So now if you just had a box and you had a collection of marbles in that box, maybe multicolored marbles, depending on what you had in that box, it doesn't really matter how those marbles are organized or ordered. That's just a set of marbles. But a list is different. We would have to essentially have bins for each of those marbles, and what color marble is in the bin is important. For a list, the list 244, I hope it's clear, is not the same as the list 424, which is not the same as the list 24. The first two are the same size. They're not the same because the order is not the same. The second or the last one's not even the same order. And if we're working with lists, they need to be the same order or the same size, little n. Yes? The question is, my notation going to be consistent with what I just wrote down? And hopefully, yes, if it isn't. So brackets for sets and parentheses for lists, hopefully. But hopefully it's clear from context what I'm meaning, if I do differ from that notation. But yes, it would be nice if I was consistent throughout the semester. So if I'm talking about a set, maybe I'll enclose those, that set in brackets, curly braces. If we do have a list, now we might want to refer to a particular marble in a particular opening or bin. Here, an element of a list is going to have a particular coordinate. For example, and I hope you know that for example is just E period G period. So I may just use EG occasionally for example. If I have this list X that's now made up of a list that's little n long, and sometimes I will say Nevada for little n, or I'll say Michigan for little m, because it may not be clear if I'm enunciating an n or an m. If I get to speaking rapidly, which is very difficult, so hopefully you'll know, but I may just say this is now Nevada long, or Michigan tall, something like that. You'll now know what I'm meaning by that. If we have this vector that's Nevada long, 
x sub 1, we will refer to that as the first coordinate. x sub 2, I think you can play along, right? That's the second coordinate. And we just keep going. x sub 3 is the third coordinate. x sub n is the nth coordinate. And once we have these lists, we can perform operations on those lists. One operation is addition. If we have a list or addition with respect to a list, list addition is performed element-wise or list addition is element-wise addition of the respective coordinates. So that if I now say z is equal to the sum of x plus y, then we have x1 plus y1, x sub 2 plus y2. We're just combining the different coordinates in the appropriate bins. x sub n is added to y sub n so that we now have an understanding of what I mean when I say z sub 1. That's just x sub 1 plus y sub 1. Or I know now what z sub 2 is, the second coordinate in that sum or the nth coordinate is z sub n. We're going to frequently have two binary operations. Binary meaning it takes two things and combines them. This is a binary addition. It takes an x and a y, two things, and combines them with a sum. We also have multiplication, scalar multiplication, where we have a scalar with a list or with a vector. And we can then do scalar multiplication. For scalar multiplication, we have multiplication of a list by a scalar number in our field, let's say A, where now if we have this scalar multiplication, it's defined as element-wise multiplication by the scalar. So defined as element-wise multiplication by the scalar. If we have now a scalar A times the list X, we just scale each of the individual coordinates in that list by the scalar A. Those are some definitions. List, addition, multiplication, scalar multiplication. That now allows us actually to create a concept called a vector space. And this is very important. So I'm putting some gold stars on the refrigerator next to vector space. If I've now put this on my refrigerator somewhere and labeled it as a vector space, you can now refer to this on page 12 of the book. And the main idea behind a vector space, this is sort of a crude way of, think of thinking about it, but there's really three concepts associated with the vector space. 
one of those concepts is you're dealing with a set. So a set is one of the concepts, and the other two are binary operations. So we have a set with two binary operations. And the binary operations you can expect, or you can sort of speculate what those are based on our previous definitions. We have vector addition. And here I'm using vector in a more general sense. So a list kind of makes it definitive, but a vector now is going to refer to multiple things, not just a tall thin column of numbers. A vector could actually be a matrix. What? That's not a vector. It's a matrix. Well, I'm calling it a vector now because I can sum two compatibly sized matrices. And I can scale them with scalar multiplication. So now in my particular discussion for whatever example I'm working on, my vector is consisting of a matrix. So that's why I'm sort of circling it in the cloud. So we're putting it in the cloud. This is really just an element of sets. Or maybe I should say elements of a set. So we have vector addition and scalar multiplication. Or another way of thinking of this is that I'm now using an abstract usage of vector. If my set is this set of two by two matrices, then each element in that set is a vector. It's not necessarily a tall, thin column, which we kind of are, that's ingrained in our thinking. But we want to sort of free that up and say, oh, he's just speaking of a vector. I now need to think more abstractly than just this tall, thin column of numbers. Here's our definition then of a vector space. But the main idea is it has three concepts, a set, that is using vector addition and scalar multiplication. So the definition of a vector space is any set V of lists that has the following properties. It needs to be closed under addition this set. So closed under addition. What does that mean? That means if I have x and y both in the vector space, then their sum needs to be in the vector space. So x plus y is an element of the vector space if x is and y is. Their sum needs to be. It also needs to be closed under scalar multiplication. So the product of A with this list X is in the vector space. If X 
starts in the vector space and A is coming from the field of numbers of that vector space. So we need closed under addition, vector addition, and closed under scalar multiplication and the following properties. We need commutativity. These are going to sort of go right along step with these properties of our field. So we have commutativity, which says that if you have x and y belonging to your vector space, it better not matter how they are added together. They commute. Likewise, they satisfy the associativity property. Meaning, if I now combine x and y and then with z, that should be the same as combining x with y and z. And if a and b are both scalars combined with x, or scaling the list x, that better be the same as a scaling bx. So now we're assuming that x, y, and z belong to the vector space and a and b are in our field of numbers. This vector space better enjoy or have the property that there's an additive identity, which means that there's a zero vector in our vector space. We have the origin. If we were dealing with a n-dimensional space, it needs to belong to our vector space so that now we have zero and x. And zero is, it's a list. It's a list of zero in each of the bins. So zero is confusing maybe in that sense, but if I say zero is an element of V, that's an element of our vector space. So these two are actually lists in our vector space. Zero can be many different things, unfortunately. And what it is depends on the context. We also need to have the multiplicative identity. Where we now have a one in our field. One is not in our list. One is a scalar here where x is a vector and 1 is in f. So 1 here is our scalar. We have a scalar in our field that allows us when it's multiplied by something in our vector space we get that same something back in our vector space. We also want to have an additive inverse where for every element x in v there exists a y also in the vector space such that x plus y produces the zero vector. Zero is not a scalar. Zero is the list, or zero is in our vector space. So all of these, x, y, and zero, are elements 
in our vector space. And finally, we have 6, which is our distributive property. which says that if we have a scalar A that's scaling the vector sum of X and Y, that A distributes across the sum to equal AX plus AY. That's when X and Y are vectors and A is a scalar. And I'm just going to be consistent. I'm just, or I'm going to pull down a B now that's also a scalar so that if I had a sum of scalars applied to a element of our vector space, those scalars distribute, whoops, it's obviously getting late, distribute across that same vector so that we now have AX plus BX. What we don't have is a multiplicative inverse, do we? In order to have a vector space. We needed that in the field, but we don't need that to define a vector space. So we'll pick up with a lot of examples next time of vector spaces so that we hopefully don't focus in on just these tall, thin columns that we've learned all about in our linear algebra class. And we'll pick up at that point next time.